Hello and welcome back as we move into module 3 of our Index 400 training for guardrail. In this particular module we're now going to cover the Instructions for Design Standards, otherwise known as the IDS. And as I had mentioned uh, earlier in the training, the purpose of the IDS is really to cover information for designers, uh, provide information for designers and some guidance for how to use a specific design standards index and for what information to provide in their plans in order for the contractor to be able to use the standard correctly. So I guess the first question is, where is it? You go to the design standards website. This format looks the same whether you're using simply the ebook or the DSR. In this case, our index 400 is currently a DSR. So you go into the DSR webpage. You can see in this column, we have a PDF for the IDS. And if you haven't seen an IDS uh, before, I invite you to go to the website, take a look at the basic format. So the IDS will provide a lot of information, a little bit of background information, such as the design assumptions and limitations, some of the criteria and specifications used to design the standard. In addition to that, our particular IDS is set up so that there are letters representing each topic, and you essentially would walk through each topic that you happen to be concerned with or you want to learn a little more about. Those topics range from the you know, approach transition connection to the rigid barrier, to the approach terminal, the various kinds of approach terminals, uh, how you select every type of end treatment. If you wanted to add you know, multiple offset blocks, what are some of the things you should consider? You know, so we've just attempted to provide some, some guidance all in one location so that the designer can, uh, can have some confidence that they're laying things out correctly in their plans and it's going to coordinate with the standard. And so the way this training is laid out is that we're going to just walk through the different letter components of the IDS in order. And the IDS itself provides a nice explanation, uh, usually just a text explanation. It'd be a paragraph or two that describes uh, how to handle each topic. But in this case, since this is a training, uh, we can go even a little bit further. We could show you some pictures and details to go along with those topics. And so to really help you guys to get an understanding of, of what components make up guardrail and what we expect you to see uh, in the plans. Now, as we walk through these topics in order, we're obviously going to see some topics we've seen before. And we set this up that way on purpose. This IDS portion does serve as a bit of a review for everything we've already seen uh, in the standard index modules. And so the idea is you kind of, you know, we'll, we'll touch on it a little more deeply. We'll explain how to place it into the plans, um, how to quantify it, how to put it in a summary box, things like that. At the same time, it gives you a review of the topic. So, you know, you will see things that are, are a little repetitive with what you've already seen, but it, it's, it's meant to give you a review. And, um, and, that's, and that's helpful. And if you were clear the first time, you see it a second time, that really drives it home, so, so you end up remembering it. Um, so that's the idea. So we'll go ahead and get going. The IDS Part B is essentially the, the length of need. We're going to start off with Part B. Part A is simply telling you to design the guardrail as it's shown in the standard and essentially you're going to emulate approach grading you know the links that are shown all the geometry that's shown in the standard you would want to copy that and follow that in your plans and it's it's saying that you need to design those segments to all fit together correctly that's basically what what part a was saying and so it seems pretty self-explanatory. You know, we spent the entire previous training talking about what's in the standard and then how you'd put that in your plans. And so now we're just gonna move on to part B. And part B is the length of need concept. So we'll go ahead and read you the definition straight out of the IDS. Length of need, otherwise known as LON, is the length of guardrail required to provide a degree of shielding to prevent errant vehicles from impacting roadside hazards. It's measured from the hazards approach face to the approach end of the redirective guardrail segment. And, you know, that's, that's a lot to take in. So we're going to show you a picture in a moment to explain all that. And then from the guardrail length to need program, it says the standard method of determining guardrail placement for shielding hazards is based on the runout length and the length of need calculation in the Astro Roadside Design Guide 4th edition. And so this is the basis for our design, moving forward with length of need. And we say a picture's worth a thousand words, so we'll go ahead and show you the picture. This one comes out of our length of need program, defines some of the variables for the most simple length of need calculation. And so it stands to reason, and we have gotten some questions on, you know, why are we changing from our previous length of need process? So if you recall, it's, it's the old calculation of uh, 13 
uh, times uppercase D minus lowercase D or 16 times uppercase D minus lowercase D. It was pretty straightforward, kind of linear calculation. The issue we have with that is that was based on uh, really decades old Ashto criteria. And in some cases, it, it, it will provide guardrail that's far too long versus the current Ashto length of need process. Um, in some cases, it actually comes up too short uh, when you have some high speed facilities. And, and that's really the last thing we want to happen. We want to make sure we have sufficient guardrail length. For example, somebody had called our office uh, using this new length of need program. And they said, well, you know, per the previous method, you know, it was saying I needed 200 feet of guardrail. And when you use the new method, uh, you only needed 60 feet of guardrail. So am I doing something wrong? What's going on? And the answer was he was designing it correctly. What's happening is the new length of need program takes into account basically the ADT, the traffic volume, and the old uh, way of doing it was, was assumed to be locked at the maximum ADT. So he had a very low ADT on his roadway. In addition to that, he had a 35 mile per hour design speed. The previous calculation was based on above or below 45 miles per hour. And so it automatically was assuming a higher speed as well as a maximum ADT. And so his guardrail was way over designed. He just happened to have a very low speed um, road that didn't have a lot of traffic on it. And so he was able to save a significant amount of guardrail. And so that's just one case. And like I said, unfortunately, we've seen cases where, well, the new length of need method would actually suggest a little bit longer guardrail uh, than the previous legacy method uh, had suggested. Um, and in that case, we know for sure we need to upgrade to the latest Ashto method. Okay, so now looking at our drawing here, you can see X is defined right here, and this would be your length of need. So it's really defined as the shortest length of guardrail required, measured from the face of the hazard that you're trying to shield to the beginning of that redirective guardrail portion, and as it's shown, you know, offset from the traffic lane. And so X is this equation. It's a simple equation. It comes from Astro Roadside Design Guide uh, 5-3. For this most simple case, we just have three variables to define it. Lateral area of concern, LA, the end treatment offset, which is Y, and the runout length, which is LR. So we'll just quickly define those. So the lateral area of concern is defined as the lesser distance from the edge of traffic lane to the clear zone limit or back of hazard. And so the idea here is that your LA Again, measured from the edge of traffic lane. Uh, everything per ASHTO is measured from the edge of traffic lane. And so that's how all of our equations are set up. When we get to the Excel portion, uh, our length of need calculations, uh, you'll find that everything's measured from the edge of traffic lane. And so you can see that LA is measured. Uh, this is the part of the equation that's essentially going to define uh, the slope of your departure line. So LA will be the lesser distance of the back of the hazard or the clear zone. The idea being that you're trying to design for the most efficient guardrail length possible. And so if you have a hazard like a canal that just continues on indefinitely, you only have to design to the extent of the clear zone uh, in order so that the guardrail doesn't have to be a very, very long length. You only design to the extent of the clear zone. If your hazard falls well within the clear zone, then you would only need to design to the back of the hazard and that would actually shorten up your guardrail length a little bit um, so you're not wasting a uh, guardrail if you don't need it. And so that's the idea for choosing the lateral area of concern. Uh, the end treatment offset, Y, is the distance at the edge of traffic lane at the start of the guardrail's redirective portion. So basically that's where it's at your start length of need. You can see the offset is right here, measured from your traffic lane. You have redirective capability of your guardrail after post 3. Um, that's true of most guardrail configurations. The runout length, LR, is something that comes from the Astro Roadside Design Guide, uh, Table 510B. That's based on the design speed uh, in miles per hour uh, and the traffic volume, ADT. And we'll show you how to grab that value off the table. So LR is this. Um, that helps define this triangle here. Okay, so we'll give you a quick example just to kind of whet your appetite uh, before we get into the actual length of need program. In the length of need program, we'll show you some even more uh, complex examples and work through them. But for now, we'll just do a, a very basic length of need calculation. So we're going to go ahead and give you some variables. So we'll just say our roadway has a design speed of 45 miles per hour and ADT of 5,000 vehicles per day. Y, we're going to go ahead and give you the variable Y of 8.5 feet. And we're just saying this is by design 
This really equals the guardrail offset plus the flare effect. So the regular guardrail offset would be LO right here, plus the flare effect at post three would give you Y. And we're, we're gonna note that Y is not considered the flare of guardrail that would be at post one. Actually, our length of need program, you're gonna input the flare, then the length of need program will back calculate Y based on this taper rate right here. But for now, just to use the Ashto uh, roadside design guide uh, criteria, um, we're just going to use Y and then just keep the equation simple. And so we'll say that's eight and a half feet. Back of the hazard, um, we'll say that that's at 22 feet, measured from the edge of the traffic lane. The clear zone, that's 24 feet. That would actually come from the PPM table. Uh, that's table 4.2.1. So we'll say, well, how do we get that? All right, well, our ADT is 5,000 vehicles per day. You see where this falls here on the table. We're at greater than or equal to 1,500 ADT. And so we would be over here. And we know we're designing for a travel lane. And so we'll go ahead and look in this column. Our design speed is given for us 45. So we go down to 45 miles per hour. And then we have our clear zone equals 24 feet. And so we'll go ahead and highlight that in green so you can see where we got that. Okay, so the next is to choose the lateral area of concern, which is LA. And so we have to decide, all right, well, how do we, how do we get an LA? We got our back of hazards 22 feet away. Uh, we know that's within the clear zone, so we're gonna have to design guardrail for it. But how long does the guardrail have to be? Well, you wanna design again for the most efficient guardrail possible. Um, in this case, you can save a few feet of guardrail by designing for the lesser offset of either the clear zone or the back of hazard. And the back of hazard happens to be a little bit less than the overall clear zone. So you only need to design for that hazard. So you go ahead and put in 22 uh, for LA. So that's 22 feet. All right, so the next value we're gonna look at is this run out length, LR. And we're gonna see how we came up with this value, 160 feet. Uh, the way we do that is to look to the Ashto Roadside Design Guide, table 5-10B. And so we can look down here. That's where this information would come from. So we say, what is our ADT? We have 5,000 vehicles per day. Uh, that puts us right here in this column. We had somebody in another class point out there's a bit of a discrepancy in this table, the way to interpret it because these values kind of overlap each other. I think we're just gonna be conservative and take it from the next higher column and go ahead and go with this column just to be conservative on the safe side. And then we have to know uh, which value to pick in the row. So we're at 45 miles per hour. Uh, that falls right between 40 and 50. You can go ahead and interpolate uh, between 190 and 130. And um, that's a pretty simple interpolation. Just split the difference between the two. It's 160 feet. So that's how you come up with your LR, which is the overall run out length. Now I want to point out that our length of need program is going to automatically grab this value for you. This table is built into the program. And so when you put in the variables of design speed and ADT, it's going to automatically grab your LR for you and it will make that a conservative assumption um, you know, for these borderline cases. And it'll automatically pick that. Also, the table has added in increments of five miles per hour with that interpolation built in. So it's gonna go ahead and grab that value. Okay, so now we've got our variables. Basically three variables, you would just uh, plug and chug. So it's LA minus Y over LA over LR. That gives you a result of length of need of 98.2 feet. And so this X right here would have to be 98.2 feet long. This would be where your redirected portion of your guardrail would have to start, also known as the start length of need. In general, also, when you're doing a simple shielding of a hazard like this, we require that the guardrail extends a minimum of six foot three inches beyond the back of the hazard as well. So that would be your most simple type of uh, guardrail length of need calculation. Okay, so I wanna point out that this length of gating previous slide was basically ignored in our length of need calculation. That stuff's considered the breakaway portion of guardrail. We'll talk a little more about that uh, on future slides to come, explain why that most of the guardrail systems have that breakaway portion. And then also we'll get into more complex examples uh, when we get into our length of need design tool. So stay tuned for that. That will come up in the next module. Okay. So in the IDS, we'll now move on to part C, where we're discussing end treatments. Straight from the IDS, it explains an end treatment segment is required for all guardrail ends where the guardrail does not transition into a barrier type, um, such as an approach or trailing end transition connection to a rigid barrier. So essentially anywhere you're not ending into a rigid barrier, you're gonna need some type of end treatment. 
end treatments are divided into three types, and this is following the AASHTO nomenclature. So we have our trailing anchorages, anchorage is an AASHTO term, our approach terminal, terminal is an AASHTO term. Approach terminals we then break down into subcategories. You could have a flared type, parallel, or double-faced. And then the other type of end treatment is a crash cushion. Okay, so the first type of end treatment, the trailing anchorage, we're going to call it the good old type 2, uh, as we've already explained. And just as the name implies, you put place it on the downstream end to basically end any run of guardrail. And it's pretty straightforward, pretty simple. You just have to look out for, well, are there any other opposing lanes around where this end of guardrail might be in the clear zone of that opposing traffic lane? So be especially cautious around two-way, two-lane roads you're likely to be in the clear zone of an opposing lane. In that case, you need an approach terminal. If not, go ahead and, and use a trailing anchorage. Okay, so the second type of end treatment is the approach terminal. You're gonna to wanna to place an approach terminal on the approach ends of all guardrail runs for all locations within the clear zone of an adjacent traffic lane. Yeah, the first option for approach terminals is the flared option. Uh, you wanna use this where raised curbs are not present and lateral clearance is available. This is the preferred option because it provides the shortest length of need requirement for shielding hazards and reduces driver propensity to shy away from the end treatment under normal conditions. So yes, under normal conditions, uh, when you have normal traffic movement coming along just basically parallel to the roadway, drivers do see a continuous uh, ob object along the side of the road. Uh, they tend to veer away from it, also known as shying away from it. So the idea is by moving the end of the guardrail as far away from the traffic as possible, you can remove some of that you know, subconscious weaving motion or, or swerving motion. And, um, you know, that has a positive effect in that way. The second option is the parallel option. You want to use this for curb conditions. So the idea is if you move uh, the face of this approach terminal as close to the curb as possible, and the curb will then have as, as little of an effect on the vehicle as possible uh, as it's impacting this approach terminal, and it will perform as close to the uh, crash testing conditions as possible. Uh, you can also, you might want to consider using this uh, when your clearance is limited. You can see that if you were to have a flared approach terminal, not only would you need uh, this six foot requirement to the slope break, but you'd probably add an additional four feet to that for your flare. And so you'd require even more right of way. So if you're trying to save right of way, parallel option might be the way to go. The third type of approach terminal is the double faced. As the name implies, you simply would use it with double faced guardrail. And it is crash worthy. We would consider that uh, the go-to option as it's the least expensive as compared to a crash cushion. But a crash cushion may be substituted to end double face guardrail. And we'll explain a little bit more about crash cushions in a moment. Okay, so continuing to talk about our end treatments as far as approach terminals go, there is a concept called the predefined length concept. And this would come straight from our standard where we have the length of end treatment defined as LE and we give a couple lengths depending on whether it's a TL3 or a TL2 design. And the idea here is that these predefined lengths are to be used when possible. Uh, they allow the contractors to use any approach terminal that's on the APL classified as either a TL3 or TL2, whichever one is needed. And so wherever possible, you want to allow enough distance or enough space in your plans for these lengths here. And you design your guardrail to this length whenever you can. It allows for the, the contractor's choice. And then the other thing to consider is when you're trying to fit in these approach terminals, uh, say between the end of a bridge railing and maybe a side street, this segment LE cannot overlap with the approach transition segment LA. And so that's the idea is you need to provide enough space for each one. Now, if you simply do not have enough space, LE won't fit in your design. And believe it or not, it, it comes up a lot. There are side streets that are near bridges. You're trying to minimize the length of your overall guardrail system uh, to the best of your ability. You know, you may need to basically not just use LA, but dig a little further in, um, you know, do a little more engineering work. You actually would dig into the APL drawings themselves. And on the APL drawings, they have these things called design length. So we're gonna discuss the design length concept. So some of the APL drawings do have listed on the design length. And design length is basically the shortest length required to function correctly and be considered crash worthy per the manufacturer. This is their suggested length, in other words, or the minimum length. And so if you use this length, then that approach terminal uh, should function as, it, as intended. 
Now, for example, the design length would be called out right here, 37 feet, 6 inches. You can see that it ends on a post. We know that all of our segments uh, have to be joined by a mid-span panel splice. And so you go ahead and add a half a post space in there. And so your overall length that you would use as your design length would be the design here, 37 foot 6 inches, plus you know half the post spacing, and you end up with 40 feet 7.5 inches. As long as you keep that outside of the other segments, mostly that approach transition connection segment, you're okay and you have enough space. Now, if you're going to do that, you're essentially um, restricting the contractor to which approach terminals they can use. So you'd have to add a design length note to the roadway plans call out in the summary of guardrail per the IDS. And we do give some guidance in the IDS. You'd want to have a note that says something like design length uh, is less than or equal to 37 and a half feet. Uh, see the summary of guardrail note. Now keep in mind, you have to provide for 47 foot 7 and a half inches in the plans, but then your design length would be limited to 37.5 feet. Okay, so speaking further about approach terminals, we'll talk about the gating concept for length of need design. Most approach terminals have a breakaway gating section between post 1 and 3, and this is how an APL drawing looks. This is typical of most approach terminals where they show their begin length of need at post 3, they show the departure line. You can see how that corresponds to our length of need drawing that's used um, in the Excel program. It corresponds pretty nicely. You have your departure line here going through post 3, they have their departure line there going through post 3, their begin length of need starts right there. This ends up being typically 12 foot 6 inches. So for most types of guardrail design where you're looking uh, for the most efficient possible design in terms of cost, you're going to go ahead and assume that there's a gating of 12 foot 6 inches. And now the reason that most approach terminals are designed this way. It's mostly for cost efficiency. Really what this is trying to do is develop the redirective capability of the guardrail as early as possible. In this case it's just by post 3. At the same time they're providing some hardware to then redirect that W beam away from vehicles upon impact to make it crash worthy. In order to do those two things simultaneously it's helpful and cheapest for them to be a separation here. And then essentially this last 12 foot 6 inch portion is considered all breakaway. And so that's the reason for that. That's the most cost effective way for them to handle it. And that would be compared to the non-gating terminal concept. These are a little bit more expensive and so that's why they're not used as frequently. However, this may be your best option if you're really confined for space. You're maybe trying to shield as much as a, of a canal as possible. So the idea here with a non-gating terminal is it doesn't have that, that breakaway portion. Essentially you're getting redirective capability at post 1 and you see how they call out their departure line going right through post 1. And that's also considered the beginning of the length of need. And so you can see how that would save you some space. Going back to the previous slide, if your length of gating LG right here was to be 0, your post 1 would essentially move back, the entire hardware apparatus would move back to right where this departure line is. So all of this portion right here would disappear and you can save some length of guardrail. And that's helpful if you're really trying to fit guardrail into a, a tight spot. You could have, a, you know, uh, there might possibly be a sidewalk or a side street trying to stop uh, before that and you're, you're really trying to squeeze it in there. Now, one thing to note is you may not save the entire 12 foot 6 beyond this impact head. There is a, a bit of a tie down here. And so my assumption would be you're probably saving about 10 feet because beyond this impact head there's a little bit extra of a tie down. Um, so that's the only thing to keep in mind is you don't save the entire 12 foot 6, but saving 10 feet is certainly helpful. Okay, so now the third type of end treatment to discuss are crash cushions. Uh, they may be used for double faced guardrail end treatments. So instead of using the double-faced approach terminal, um, that would be the, the least expensive option, you may want to consider using a crash cushion. So from the IDS, the quote says, uh, where applicable, use a crash cushion on the approach ends of double-faced guardrails as a substitute for double-faced approach terminals. Crash cushion use should be considered for locations with an expected high frequency of severe impact, such as within the gore area of a high-speed facility. So what I always imagine for this is like an exit ramp um, on a freeway, you typically have vehicles with a lot of uh, weaving motion back and forth right in front of where that guardrail might end in the gore area. The vehicles 
on a regular everyday basis are pointed directly at the end of that guardrail system as they make decisions and weave back and forth and, and maybe exit the roadway. You would expect a location like that might receive uh, more impacts than guardrail that's ending off to the side of the road and that the vehicles are not continuously pointed at it in their normal traffic pattern movement. And so for cases like that, you might want to consider uh, putting a crash cushion on there. So the idea of a crash cushion is, well, the initial installation is going to cost more. It's more robust. Um, some of them are designed to absorb some of the energy of the impact. But the idea is that the companies tend to compete over what is their cost of maintenance when those things are impacted? How much does it cost to reset the crash cushion? So then it can then perform again and, and take on a second and third and fourth crash. Uh, so they basically can reset it. Uh, there are some crash cushions out there where they advertise for only a matter of dollars and a couple pins, we can reset this crash cushion so that it will be in the original condition and, and it'll be ready to go again. For a double face approach terminal, when that takes an impact and, and you go through the grading portion, it all breaks away you would essentially have to go out and replace that entire approach terminal system. Whereas a crash cushion, it's designed to take a hit, basically be reset and be reused again. So that's the key here is crash cushions tend to be designed to be reusable. It's not always the case that they take a really severe impact, but for the most part, they tend to be reusable. So if you expect it to get hit more than once, you may get some cost savings out of it. And you know, it is an engineering decision, engineering judgment, whether or not you're gonna want a crash cushion on your particular job. So we say, you know, if you're still not clear, not sure, um, use engineering judgment or uh, ask uh, Derwood Shepard and we'll give you uh, his contact information too. Okay, so moving along to part D of the IDS, we have our approach transition connections to rigid barrier. Uh, we had covered these pretty well in the index modules. And so we'll just give it another brief look. And the idea here is that in your plans, you wanna provide for at least the length LA. It's measured from the face of the rigid barrier and that LA segment uh, has to fall outside of other segments uh, like the approach terminal LE and you just want to make sure you have enough space for that and it's all accounted for in your final design. Pipe rail and again we we cover this pretty well in the index portion but we'll give it a quick review you know you place your pipe rail segments when you're, when you're within four feet of a sidewalk or shared use path as a designer you want to assume that the contractor is going to use steel posts and if they use steel posts, they might have to use pipe rail if they're within four feet of a sidewalk or shared use path. So you wanna draw it in there and you wanna have it quantified. So here's an example of a plan view call out of how you would label your, your pipe rail. So you basically just call it begin pipe rail, uh, give it a station, give it an offset, and then your end pipe rail station and offset. As far as tabulating this in the summary box, you wanna measure it along the center line and you wanna account for roadway curvature and things like that. And so this red is just depicting uh, the length that you'd actually measure. You'd include this in your summary guardrail box. Summary guardrail boxes are covered in the BOE manual, chapter eight. And in upcoming slides, I'm gonna show you a summary box for some other items, but for now, we'll just say, here's how you'd call out uh, where, to, where to begin pipe rail and where to end pipe rail. And one thing I'd wanna reiterate is that you'd wanna place your pipe rail um, outside of any approach uh, transition connection segments or any approach terminal segments. And then moving on to rub rail, uh, it's pretty similar to pipe rail in terms of how you'd call it out. And so you can see that we have our begin rub rail called out at a station and rub rail called out at a station. You'd wanna measure the length along the center line, again, accounting for any type of roadway curvature. You include that in the summary of guardrail box and in this case, uh, you wanna keep that rub rail outside of approach terminal and trailing anchorage uh, segments uh, so that the hardware can function correctly without any interference. All right, moving into part G uh, for deep posts. In the index portion, we covered this pretty well in terms of how these things function. If you recall, you do need the approval of the district design engineer uh, in order to use these and the contractor needs designer approval. These need to be placed in the plans in order for the contractor to use them. And so we don't expect them to be used uh, that frequently, um, but it could help you out if you have some right away constraints. And so here's an example of how you'd call out some deep posts along your guardrail length. And so for example, you could say begin deep posts uh, at station 100. If you happen to know that your slope break is coming very close to the uh, 
to the edge of roadway here. You just simply uh, don't have room in your right of way to have that slope break be two feet behind the post. And so you start calling out deep posts. So you say begin deep post at station 100. Uh, you're moving right along the end deep posts at 100 plus 57. And we do show a hazard here. You could still have an above ground hazard even if you have a slope break. So keep that in mind. Now, to determine the quantity of these deep posts, you really would do that old uh, engineering calculation where, okay, say in this case, you see that you have 57 feet of deep posts at the maximum because you know the extent of where that slope breaks. So then you, you take your total 57 feet, you divide it by your post spacing, which is 6.25, and then you add one. And then you can just put that number directly into your summary of guardrail box. I'll show you an example of that summary guardrail box um, coming up, but that's just an idea of how to handle it. There is a different way to handle it uh, using the CAD tools and the DNC manager specifically. I'll cover that on an upcoming slide. Okay, so just to revisit, uh, we got part H uh, in our IDS. Explains a little bit about the modified mounts and special posts and it just tells when to use each one. So if you recall, you use uh, the special steel post if you happen to fall uh, directly atop um, one of these structures, uh, such as a curb inlet. Um, you can use the encase post uh, for shallow mounts if you're trying to go over utilities. Uh, it'll save you about 20 inches of depth. And then you can use the frangible leave out if you happen to be going uh, directly through the concrete sidewalk. And now we're going to show you how to call these things out in your plans. Just some quick examples. So for example, if you had frangible leave outs uh, between station 101 and 101 plus 37.5, that would probably be where your concrete sidewalk happened to be between here and here. You may not know exactly from your plans exactly where those posts are going to fall. So you always want to assume the worst case and have it covered. You want to have the extent covered of whatever segment you're trying to pass through, whether it be underground utilities around or, uh, or a structure. In this case, you happen to know there's a concrete sidewalk from that station to that station and your guardrail goes right through it. So you call out the maximum extent of where that sidewalk is. So in this case, you'd want to know, okay, how do we tally these things up? Well, it's the same as, as we had described uh, earlier for the deep posts. For the frangible leave outs, you say, okay, well, we've got 37.5 feet of these. So you say 37.5 feet divided by the post spacing of 6.25 and you add one and you end up with seven. Um, and so you go ahead and fill that into the table as it's shown, you show the extent of the stationing. And then this basically tips off the contractor of where these type of special posts are gonna be used. Now, there's another way to do this specifically it's helpful if you're only talking about one post. So say you, you have a utility uh, running perpendicular to the road and you know, okay, probably going to require one in case post to go over that utility. So you can go ahead and call it out at the station where the utility happens to be. So in this case, it'd be 101 plus 56.3. And one way to do this is to use the DNC manager. I know speaking with Denise Broom, she wanted to add some automation to this. So you can essentially, there's a level where you can drop a point in here, or you know, if you happen to know that you're gonna need multiple posts, you can drop multiple points. You just go point, 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 right along there. And then when you use the DNC manager with the correct pay item chosen, and then you use the data link manager to generate the table, it will automatically populate the table based on all those points that you dropped. Um, the only issue with that is that you may have an individual table entry for every single point that you dropped. And you know, if we had the days of digital plans, maybe it doesn't matter. So you're not concerned about wasting paper. If it were me, I like to have things uh, be kind of as tight as possible and easy to understand as possible. So I prefer just to tally these up myself because it's a pretty simple calculation to do and just have individual entries if you know you're gonna have multiple posts in a row. And then the other thing we're showing as part of the summary of guardrail we haven't gotten to guardrail length yet. I'll cover that in a moment, but just quickly uh, touching upon how you'd call out an end terminal, or in this case, an approach terminal. You call out, you got your TL3 flared terminal and the stationing and offset. And so you say you have one of those and you can see the pay item for it. In the design notes, it's very helpful to explain what that flare is. That may even keep you from having to do uh, offset call outs beyond the flare because contractors will know if you have a four foot flare, then the actual face of guardrail uh, will be four feet closer to the road 
than what the end of the guardrail is called out at. So it's helpful to use this design note to put four feet for a flare. Okay, touching on how we would call out guardrail tapers. You look to here, you say begin guardrail taper, give it a station and offset, end taper station offset. Those offsets and those stations would then define the taper rate for the contractor, so it's up to the designer to get it correct. Uh, we'll ask some questions about this on upcoming slides, but for now just realize that this is covered in the IDS and it's explained that for a design speed less than or equal to 45 miles per hour, the maximum taper rate is 1 to 10. For a design speed greater than 45 miles per hour, uh, the maximum taper rate is 1 to 15. The taper rates also may be refined further per Ashto Roadside Design Guide. There are recommended taper rates in Ashto Roadside Design Guide as well. They get a little more specific on design speed, but are above and below 45 miles per hour is what we've used in the past. If you want to look into Ashto, feel free and you can also use those as well. That's a, that's a good justification for how you've laid out your plans. Okay, so our median crossover guardrail is the IDS Part J. And so we'll just talk about this once more. Uh, we did cover it pretty well in the index, but again, it's if you understand this concept, then you're going to get one of the major points of this training. And so you'd want to use this essentially when you have dual bridges that you're approaching and you have a median that's pretty narrow. And so what happens is you use this when an opposing lane's concrete rigid barrier is within the clear zone aligned laterally across the median. So for these guys up here, going right to left for this traffic, because this is a narrow median, this rigid barrier is within their clear zone, and so you have to shield that barrier. And because of that, you need guardrail. So now, now you've got guardrail here. Now the second reason you'd want to use median crossover, and you have to have all these conditions, is that the guardrail system you're putting in to shield this barrier is now in the clear zone of this traffic going from left to right. And so now you have your back of posts and that's considered a hazard. And so then you have to put panels across them in order to make that crash worthy for these, these guys in this traffic going from left to right here. So now you have double faced guardrail. The third criteria is the guardrail system, including the end treatment will be designed for the shortest minimum length. So, and that is where this taper comes in, where you start tapering across the median. That's why we call it a crossover because the guardrail itself is crossing over. And what that does is it really does save on your length of need. Even if your guardrail crossover only has a lateral offset of six or seven feet, you only tapered across six or seven feet, that could save 60 or 70 feet of guardrail. So you do get a lot of cost savings out of that. The added benefit also is that the crash cushion of the approach terminal is moved as far away from traffic as possible towards the center of the median just to avoid impacts on that end treatment is something you, you certainly want to do. So if keeping that as far away from traffic is preferred. And so that's when you'd want to, that's when you'd want to use a, a crossover. Now, if you don't care about having the shortest length of guardrail, and the only reason you really wouldn't want to be concerned with that is because you may have hazards all along the median and you need to shield those. And so in order to do that, you need to have a guardrail system that just continues on and in that case, you'd likely have single-faced guardrail along here, and then you'd have single-faced guardrail connecting to this rigid barrier as well, so you can shield the hazard from both sides. That would continue on. That's assuming you have additional hazards you're trying to shield. If you're not really concerned about that, you want the shortest length of guardrail, use a median guardrail crossover. Okay, so this explains that we're reducing our length of need as much as possible and shielding both directions of traffic, hence the double-faced guardrail. These are the callouts that are required to define this segment. And as we've said before, you need your begin end of guardrail at both sides, begin end of taper at both sides. And for quantity purposes, the entire length of guardrail may be considered double faced. That's how you would tally it up uh, just for simplicity. Despite the fact that that's single faced, we just consider it double. And the plans, you'd want to graphically show that this is double faced guardrail to avoid any contractor confusion. Don't just use the single faced guardrail line style go ahead and use double faced so that there's no conflicts uh, with the standard. And then the FDOT guardrail length of need program will assist with coming up with these station and offsets. So there's going to be four of them. Here's our sneak peek of the drawing. Uh, this came right out of the Excel spreadsheet and it looks like there's a lot of variables, but the nice thing is it's only a one step process. A lot of these variables, the program will provide for you. So, these X's are outputs, the Y is an output, 
LP1 and LP2 are inputs, however those are default values, these are parallel lengths. And so once you have the, the variables understood, you get your result, which would be a station and offset at these four locations. You then plug those into your plans and draw it accordingly. And so we'll cover that when we get to our uh, length of need portion, or length of need module of this training. Okay, the IDS part K covers the reduced post spacing segments. So we're just gonna quickly give you an idea of how you would label that. So for example, you say you begin your quarter spacing at station 100, end it at station 100 plus 57. The nice thing about this is included in the standard guardrail pay item is reduced post spacings. And so there's really no need to tabulate this. You just wanna show it clearly in your plan view. Graphically, you don't have to show all the extra posts. We're just showing you that for clarity in this training but you do want to have these call outs be very clear for the contractor and then the standard will automatically adjust those spacings accordingly incrementally okay so we'll cover offset blocks adding additional offset blocks so here you see you have a ground level obstruction this looks like it would have interfered with the posts had you continued along keeping your face a guardrail in the same location so you want to increase the lateral offset of that post to then miss the ground level obstruction. So you could add up to two additional offset blocks. The contractor also has the option in the field if they come across something in the ground that's ground level that they're trying to avoid with the post, so the post can go around it. They are permitted to add up to two additional offset blocks to, to avoid that in-ground obstruction. They can bill you, again, beyond the plans quantity that hadn't been tabulated, and every district handles that a little differently. What's nice is that the standard does handle automatically shifting that miscellaneous asphalt further back behind the post. So everything's measured from the face of guardrail. And then when the post starts to shift back, that asphalt then does extend even further back, you know, to keep the same distance from the back of the post. The same is true for the required slope break location. So you always have to maintain your slope break at two feet behind the back of the post. And it's important to, to keep track of that, if you do add multiple offset blocks in your plans, you also have to make sure that your slope break is gonna move along with the back of the guardrail post and that you have the proper embankment so that the quantities are all correct for the contractor, they're not caught by surprise. Unfortunately, you know, if you start adding multiple offset blocks, the post could be very close to that, that slope break and it would be a violation. So the slope break has to move along with it and you need to account for that. Okay, now probably, you know, the most in-depth nuance possible of adding additional offset blocks. And, you know, you almost don't have to remember it because if you are considering adding multiple offset blocks, you can look at the IDS part L and it'll just remind you the type of things to consider. But one thing you have to think about is that the setback distance to a hazard, this required setback distance measured from the face of guardrail to the hazard is based on the face of guardrail. And if that remains in the same location, you could imagine what would happen if you start adding multiple offset blocks, the post gets pushed further and further back towards the hazard. Now when a vehicle, if a vehicle does impact the guardrail and the post starts to rotate, the back of the post is going to be a lot closer to the hazard and therefore you have to make an adjustment for that required setback distance. Okay, just to show you an example of adjusting the required setback, we'll look at what we have here where we're saying that our post spacing is at one foot six and three quarters. So we basically are gonna say, okay, we've got quarter post spacing. So our setback requirement is three foot two inches. Our hazard has to be at or beyond three foot two inches from the face of that guardrail. Okay, so we're gonna go in and add two offset blocks. We know um, from the previous modules that the offset block depth is seven and a half inches per offset block. And so that post is gonna be shifted 15 inches towards the hazard. Because of that, you have to adjust your required setback distance by 15 inches. So your new required setback distance measured from the face of guardrail is now four and a half inches. And I mean, there, there likely won't be a lot of uh, circumstances where you both have a ground level obstruction and a hazard back here you're trying to avoid. But if that nuance does happen, uh, you have to make sure that that's accounted for. Okay, moving on in the IDS to part M, uh, gives a brief explanation on CRT segments. We do have our 24 foot radius system shown here. And so again, in your plans, you'd want to call out your begin end of CRT segment. You also have to list the radius and then the contractor knows to start building it from this location. Plan view, this would be where your begin end guardrail is called out. This also happens to be the station where you would define your end treatment assembly for CRT. 
So you have your end treatment CRT and you have the pay item number. You'd have to call that out in your summary of guardrail box and that would be called out at the same station as the begin end guardrail at post one. So you can see it's called out here. Um, we have recently made the specifications a lot more simple. There's no longer a shop vent panel pay item. That's now included in the price of standard guardrail. CRT posts are also included in the price of standard guardrail. Prices were so similar, uh, we couldn't justify having separate pay items anymore, and this makes it a lot more simple for engineers. Saving all that engineering time is, is more valuable than, than keeping track of the small difference between these types of things. And so now all of these different items are included in the price, the linear foot cost of general uh, WBM guardrail. And so for that reason, you just show that the guardrail continues all the way to post one as you normally would. And this really has no other effect on the way you'd have to call this out in terms of quantities. The only thing you have to remember is to put in the CRT end treatment and tabulate that in your summary of guardrail box because that does need to be paid for separately. You also have to remember your clear area limits. Remember we said that you have to draw this entire system in the plans as it's shown in the standard. It's only been crash tested with the entire system in place and that's the way it has to be used. You have to keep all of this area clear of any above ground hazards because when a vehicle does impact this at 90 degrees, it's gonna require all of this space in order to absorb that energy and capture the vehicle. Okay, the topic of slope guards. We're gonna talk quickly about how we would put that in the summary of guardrail box. And so for example, you would have a slope guard called out at this location. We'll say that's our first entry. You pick in general the station that's about average of where that's located. So if contractor looking through here would be able to quickly locate and know which slope guard you're talking about as opposed to other slope guards. You would tabulate it as whatever the nearest type of guardrail happened to be. So if your guardrail was TL3, general guardrail, nearby just the adjacent stuff you're using, it could, it could also be TL2, but if it's TL3 or TL2, you would just use the same type of guardrail just so that it's accounted for in the plans and then you know you can say that okay this this length right here for example we would say that it was 38 feet and so you go ahead and tabulate it as 38 feet now the design notes again it's going to take advantage of these labeling it a slope guard in the, in the design notes would tip off the contractor that that is the slope guard so he knows what you're talking about he doesn't think you you, you tabulated a guardrail you know double for for this general area the contractor knows that that's the slope guard and and then the other thing, as we had mentioned in the index portion, is when you draw this in, per the index, the end of these need to be within one feet, basically, of the, the back side of that concrete barrier. And so the contractor has multiple options to make that happen. Really, their only requirement is that they have to keep even post spacing, uh, just so that it aesthetically looks symmetrical. We allow them to then increase the post spacing um, in order to, to get that higher resolution to kind of fit in between these, these two uh, concrete walls here. And then they're allowed to cut off guardrail panels, you know, right immediately behind the, po the post um, so they can get whatever length they're looking for. And then they could also add or subtract these end units. The end units will, will add or subtract a, a foot and a half or so. That's another tool they can use just to get closer to that concrete. That's an option for them. It's just another way to extend the reach of that guardrail one way or the other. So, so they have multiple ways of, of meeting that link. They just need to get within one feet of the concrete. And just remember, this is not crash worthy. It just basically provides uh, some type of visual uh, obstruction uh, for maintenance crews. Uh, if somebody's riding a lawnmower along, um, they have some indication that there's a drop off there. Also, you should note that the face of this guardrail needs to be placed at six foot six inches from this drop off. This follows along uh, with the structures uh, design guide. They have some details in there, uh, basically explaining that they would require this three foot berm and then they want a little bit of extra asphalt. I think they need like a resting location for inspectors. They basically need a flat surface in there to be able to get some access to the bridge. And so we've gone along uh, with what's in the structures manual and the structure design guidelines in terms of our offset. So it has to be six foot six inches uh, from, that, from that big slope break right there. And the final thing I add is that if your project happens to have some type of other visual physical barrier, such as some type of concrete wall, you know, anything that, again, like a maintenance crew would see that to prevent them uh, from accidentally running off that slope break. Uh, if you have something else in there, then 
the guardrail slope guard would not be required. So if you have a substitute for the guardrail slope guard, that's perfectly acceptable, and that would just be an engineering judgment. Okay, so we finished the letter portion of the IDS, and now we're just going to move into some plans content requirements. For the most part, we'll start off with the general. We just say it's the same old, same old, where you'd show the guardrail system to scale. And by that, I mean, you know, from a plan view standpoint, you can just use the line style and you don't need to be especially concerned with where the posts are shown. It's not expected that you would know exactly where every post would fall, but you do want to show in general the line style that looks like guardrail. So you show that system to scale, which the line style is for the most part laterally. You include the depiction of the post offset block and the panel type and its design location. And by design location, I'm, I'm talking offset and length in general, overall length typical sections you'd want to design and label the lateral offsets from the face of the curb or the edge of the traffic lane as it corresponds to the guardrail sections uh, sheet in the index so you would get your information for the required uh, face of guardrail offset from the PPM uh, chapter 2 and chapter 4 and then wrote the cross section and typical sections you'd want to meet the offset requirements of the PPM and the adjacent grading requirements um, as shown in the index and so, as I said, this lateral offset in the standard is a placeholder. The designer would end up designing that and showing it for the contractor, basically defining it for the contractor. However it's drawn in the plan view is how the contractor is going to then have to, have to uh, construct it. Okay, so now we'll move into speaking about our naming conventions. Looks like uh, there's a lot of text here on this slide. The good news is we have seen all these things. Uh, we've covered these topics uh, several times already, so they, they should be pretty familiar. The idea behind providing um, naming conventions in general, or just providing this list, you know, normally we try to, to provide designers with as much flexibility as possible, but there are cases where just giving a, a list of standard callouts is helpful because one, it just makes it real obvious the type of things that we're looking to see in the plans and the type of things that contractors would want to be looking for uh, in order to construct the guardrail. And so just briefly looking down the list, uh, you realize, you know, if you've caught everything or not, if you've included everything or not, you're, you're not going to end up using every single one of these, you know, call outs, but it's just a helpful uh, reminder just to, to check down the list. So looking at some of these naming conventions, uh, the very first thing we start off with is begin and end of guardrail stations. And we've now formalized this. Guardrail can be abbreviated uppercase G, uppercase R period. Uh, we had seen that in some roadway plans and uh, we liked it. I mean, it was clear to us immediately what the designer was talking about, even though that, that wasn't really an official abbreviation of any kind. But it makes sense and it's nice and short. Uh, so the idea with the abbreviations, you know, we try to make these as short as possible. We always know paper space is sometimes limited. Uh, you're trying to squeeze as much into that, that sheet of paper as you can. So. For example, this would probably end up saying, you know, begin, GR, STA, period. Um, so that'd be pretty short, you know, way of calling something out. Okay, so having said that, there's a couple things to understand. Essentially, when you just call out beginner end of guardrail station, that's automatically going to mean TL3 guardrail. That's the general guardrail. It's like, it's almost like the default. And so the contractor knows that's even in the standard. It explains that if they just see beginner end guardrail, then that just means TL3. That's going to be used most of the time. Now the special case is TL2, and obviously that's only allowed under certain conditions. Otherwise, it wouldn't be safe. So for the TL2 callout, you would then have to modify the label, and it would say begin end TL2 guardrail. And you want to make sure you put that TL2 everywhere as the qualifier, uh, just to make it completely obvious you know, to the contractor uh, what they should be using and they, they don't forget and accidentally put in TL3. So then we have more call outs, uh, begin and taper stations. As we've said, I mean, this is, this is one of the major uh, new concepts of this training moving forward is that, you know, by, by letting the designer call out the begin and end of tapers, uh, it really gives you some, some flexibility just to get the guardrail where you want, make transitions as you need them for your different typical sections. So you just follow the prescribed taper rates. The contractor knows it's linear and you're good to go on that. Begin and end CRT segments, the only real thing to know about this is, you know, you put that as it corresponds to what's drawn in the standard. You want to define the exact radius that you're going to use that matches what's in the standard, and you go ahead and put that right in the call out. So it would say begin and end CRT, you know, for example, 16 foot radius, and then you give the station an offset. Uh, begin and end pipe rail stations, we've covered that pretty extensively. Begin and end rub rail stations, and then, you know, you got your uh, reduced spacing section, so your begin and half spacing, re uh, begin and quarter spacing stations, and, and so on.
Moving on, we have some more standard nomenclature here. So these would be callouts for guardrail end features. And so we've got you know our, our different types of terminals. Uh, these, obviously, as you know, a terminal, that does mean the approach terminal. Uh, we've shortened it up. It just said terminal because per ASTO, that would always mean something that goes on the approach. And so just to get you the shortest uh, possible call out, we've tried to make these as brief as we could. You might want to call out a crash cushion or your type 2 anchorage. Uh, per ASHTO anchorage is always on the trailing end. And so the contractors would see that trailing anchorage, that type 2 anchorage means trailing anchorage. And you can use that as a label. And then TL2 and TL3, these are the approach transition connections to rigid barrier. Abbreviated it. Uh, this is the standard. Of, these two are the standard abbreviations that are in the standards, in the list of standard abbreviations. This one's a little bit funky for approach, um, but that's clearly defined in the standard. And I think it'd quickly be figured out what you're talking about, um, you know, if you point it to the correct item. And like I said, that's a standard abbreviation. And then the other thing about these uh, particular callouts, these labels may be included with the begin and guardrail stations. And we're going to show you some drawings and the slides coming up, and we'll show you those callouts. Okay, so just rounding out a few more things we're looking for in the list, and you may not have these things on your project, but it's nice to just go down the list and make sure you define them all if you do. These would be the special posts, so you have your encased post, your special steel post for mounting atop a structure, uh, frangible leave-outs for mounting on top of sidewalk, etc. You know, you got your deep posts uh, for your slope rate condition, uh, only if it's approved. Uh, you have added offset blocks, and then you call out your guardrail slope guard. That's that piece of guardrail that goes between the bridges uh, to protect from that slope abutment drop off. Okay, so your summary of guardrail table, you're going to want to include the pay items from the FDOT design quantities and estimate system. So that's the DQE that comes out of the basis of estimates, which is the BOE. And these pay items are defined, or some of them are defined in specifications 536 for guardrail. Uh, if you want more information on the summary of guardrail table, you'd see the basis of estimates chapter 8, and that'll explain a little bit more about summary boxes and why they're used. And then, you know, really, in order to put together a summary box, that would require almost an entire course and a training in itself if you're going to use the department's CAD tools. So those tools, including the design and computation manager and the data link manager, they may be used to assist in creating that table. Roadway designers uh, with a lot, lot of history in that uh, tend to even know more about that than me. But if you're, if you're new to it, you can get some training on that. And that's located at this location. I put the website so you can get that. We have, uh, you know, from your PDF of the PowerPoint, the website is right here. But basically it's on the, on the engineering CAD systems office website. And they have a full, uh, they have a webinar for putting together summary boxes. All right, so we'll get into talking about measuring the length of guardrail. We had mentioned, you know, several times throughout the training that you're going to measure typically post one to post one, where in the standards it says beginner end guardrail, and then that just includes the entire length. So the thing to understand about measuring guardrail, and we have gotten the question in the past, um, our specification notes now make this a lot more clear, is that guardrail it is measured post one to post one. Then you would also call out something like an approach terminal on each end. And people say, well, that approach terminal is like, you know, 53 feet long. Are we double dipping? We're paying for this twice because we're measuring the guardrail all the way through the approach terminal. And so we do get the question. And the answer to that is that something like an approach terminal or an approach transition connection uh, to a rigid barrier, those costs uh, as they're in our system of pay items are considered above and beyond uh, the typical linear foot price of guardrail. So basically the equivalent price of guardrail um, for that 53 foot approach terminal would already be covered in the payment for guardrail. And then all the additional hardware of that approach terminal that's above and beyond the general WBM guardrail, that's what will be covered in that pay item for approach terminal. So that's essentially how it works. And the idea is that we didn't want when you call out a beginner end of guardrail, for that to be something different than the beginner end of guardrail payment, um, we want when you call out a station for guardrail uh, to make it obvious that yes, you do have enough space for that guardrail if it happens to be ending prior to a sidewalk or a side street um, or something of that nature. Really, designers should only ever have to worry about one end of guardrail and then any additional hardware or add-on you add to that is, is a cost that's above and beyond. And so, 
you know, the cost of guardrail of the equivalent link will essentially be subtracted from that. And contractors get to understand that and they price things accordingly. Okay, so now a quick example of that guardrail measurement is drawn right here. And so you can see that the callout includes both the beginning of the guardrail and the flare terminal. And they're both in the same callout. They'd be considered at the same station. They both should be called out essentially at post one. And so this one happens to start uh, at station 99. It ends at station 100 plus 87.5. And so you go down and say, okay, well, there's your W beam guardrail. It's called out from station 99 to 100 plus 87.5. And then the overall length is 187.5. So that's all included right there. In addition to that, you would also call out as a, the different pay item this end treatment that's flared. And so for this case, uh, you'd call out one unit of each at each station location. And you can see the 99 corresponds to the 99. The 100 plus 87.5 corresponds to where the guard, you know, to where the guardrail ends and where that approach terminal would begin coming from the other direction. And so that's how it would work. And then I'll, I'll mention again, it is helpful in the design notes if this does happen to be flared to go ahead and, and say that that's a four foot flare um, that helps the designer. Then if you give a station an offset for post one, they would also know that the general run of guardrail would essentially be four feet closer to the roadway. And so it helps, it may save you some call outs on the plans uh, just to go ahead and call out a four foot flare. Okay, so looking at another guardrail length example, you can see that on the left side, we're connected to an, a rigid barrier here and we have our approach transition. And so that's called out as well as the begin of the guardrail. And that will be typical. You can call those both out using the same arrow. And then on the other side, uh, this one terminates the same way the previous example ended, um, where you have the end of guardrail as well as a TL3 flare terminal called out. And you have the station for that. So just looking at the stations of this overall run of guardrail and just assuming this is linear and that you can use the stationing to determine the length. You know, sometimes you can't just use stationing to determine the length. Uh, particularly for a guardrail that's on a curve, the center line of the roadway could be offset a significant amount from the guardrail. So if you're on the curve, let's say you're 60 feet from the center line on the outside of a curve, uh, your guardrail would be much longer than measuring stations. And so for that, you know, I always recommend anytime you're gonna you're gonna quantify guardrail, you're gonna want to use your CAD tools to measure the exact line of that guardrail and then use that rather than just look at station to station. But station to station is essentially the identifier for the summary box and it helps um, the contractors to locate the guardrail. Okay, so getting back to the question, what's the length of the guardrail assuming this is all linear and there's no curvature? The taper rate would have a slight effect, uh, but not much for, for the most part, just looking at stations. What will we say that overall length is? And so just looking at the stations, we go station to 100 to station 110. So 10 stations is 1,000 feet. And so that's what we're looking for, just to give you guys a feel for it. Uh, what's the station of the approach transition? Okay, that's called out over here. That will be station 100. Approach transitions are called out um, essentially at this connection point right here. And remember, you measure to the end of the guardrail panel. So that's really would be the post bolt hole of the panel within that thrive beam terminal connector and that's called out pretty clearly in the standard. So it's measured post one um, to the center of that connection as it's shown in the standard and that would be station 100. Uh, what's the station and flare of the end treatment? And so we didn't really give the flare here but you can infer what it might be. You can see that the last station to be called out in the typical or the last station and offset rather had a 52 foot offset. And so coming along here, okay, now you have your flare at post one. Now you're at a 56 foot offset. And just knowing uh, what our standard flares are, the maximum is four feet. Uh, that tends to be a popular one. And so you can say, okay, you got a four foot difference there. So I'm gonna go ahead and say that, that flare would be four feet. Um, and then again, the station is 110. That's called out right above it. Okay, so another length example. This time we're showing our our median crossover style guardrail. And again, it takes kind of four call outs to define the thing. And the idea here, you know, I say Pythagorean theorem anyone in order to determine the actual length. And you know, I don't expect you guys to do that in, in the training, but the idea is just, is just to, to understand that it's not just station to station, you actually follow along that line that follows the front face of the guardrail. And so just using all these station and offset call out information, you can actually come up with those lengths and 
you end up with 137.5, which is a little bit longer than station to station. Now, what's nice is our Excel spreadsheet we've developed. It's going to give you all these station and offsets automatically, and then it automatically adjusts to the nearest panel length, and it takes that diagonal angle into account. So this whole thing is theoretically constructible because that would be a standard length. Crash cushion parallel length would be a standard length as well. And then if you have an even number of panels between here and here, it's theoretically constructible to the nearest panel. And so it takes that into account when it outputs those station and offsets. Then for your quantities, you would basically just use your CAD tools and measure what that line length is. And you can, you know, you can either add up the panels, add up these parallel segments, or you can just use your CAD tools, measure along that line and come up with the total length. And so there's multiple ways of doing that, but the, the Excel sheet is certainly pretty helpful with that. So what type of guardrail is this measured length? Okay, so it looks like, well, we got mostly double-faced, a little bit of single-faced here. So, you know, remember what we said to avoid confusion with that and, and worrying about how far these panels come, uh, we're just going to make a simplified assumption and all this guardrail can be considered double-faced uh, when you quantify it in your summary box. Uh, what station is the approach transition called out at? So, again, we're not trying to trick you here, just station 99. So you can see that's our abbreviation for approach transition. We try to shorten it up as much as we could, station 99. Okay, uh, another guardrail linked example. Okay, here we've got our begin TL3, or our begin guardrail, and also our TL3 approach transition. They're called out at station 100, uh, the same location. Uh, they got an offset of 50 feet. Then on the other end, you're at station 100 plus 84.3. You got an offset here, 54, and so let's see if we got any questions here. So what type of guardrail is this measured link between here and here? It's the single face W beam. And one other thing I'm going to point out is that this does represent, as the note says, the shortest length of guardrail. And now we're going to ask you how we came up with that length. So okay, it looks like we've got 84.3 feet as our total length of guardrail here. And we're telling you it's the it's basically the shortest length, just using the standard uh, the design standard lengths. So looking at the next page, uh, this is how we'd come up with that. And I do have a handout. Uh, we're going to include that uh, at the end of our PowerPoint of this training uh, that shows you how we come up with some of these lengths. But it is pretty simple just to to go ahead and grab it out of the standard as well. So the shortest length would be to use the different segments, put them together. So you have your approach transition connection to the rigid barrier. In this case, it would be a TL3. So you could see there, it's the 30 feet, 7 and 3 quarter inches. And then down here, you have your LE. If it's TL3, it'd be 53 feet, 1 and a half inches. And so essentially all you're going to do is add those together. So you got your LA, and this is measured from the face of the rigid barrier so that you know how much space you have to work with from the rigid barrier. So you basically have your LA plus seven and a quarter plus your LE, and that gives you 84.3, total length of guardrail. Okay, so now following along with the examples in our IDS, we're gonna show you a, a, the taper example one more time. We'll ask you some questions about that uh, just to see if you can get some of the concepts. So just looking at this drawing here, we ask what is the likely offset difference between the shoulder line and the face of guardrail? And now the shoulder line, we have that defined in the standard as basically the toe of that rigid barrier. And then the face of guardrail would typically be, um, in this case, per the PPM section. Uh, it looks like you have a hazard here to protect, so you've extended this guardrail some distance. Uh, you have a nice run of guardrail. And so what would be the difference between those two? And it's normally two feet per the PPM. So really that edge of shoulder plus two feet is the distance from the shoulder line to the face of guardrail. That's pretty pretty common. What is the approximate taper rate shown here? So how would we come up with that? Okay, it looks like um, between this station, which is at 28.1, uh, this station's at 58.1. Okay, so that's 30 feet between here and here, and then it's all gonna taper two feet. We know one of our standard taper rates is one to 15. So that's our taper rate, one to 15. Using the design standard drawing for approach transitions, where did this taper shown begin? So remember looking at our design standards, there was one section there that always called out where our taper would, would begin in terms of this approach transition connection to rigid barrier. 
Uh, so go ahead and check out the next page. Uh, the answer is section EE. So looking at the standard drawing, that taper would begin at section EE, and that's clearly called out that way for the contractor. As the designer, you take your cue from that, and it's also visually it shows uh, the guardrail begin its taper. That's located about 28.1 feet um, from the begin end guardrail station. You can see that using the elevation view, or you can just add up the panel lengths uh, to come up with that. Okay, so now we're going to move into the last portion of our IDS where we show uh, several layout examples of where you'd place guardrail as a designer. And the whole idea is, you know, in general, we're trying to shield hazards, anything within the clear zone. Uh, you as the designer would determine that and what hazard you would like to shield. And so we show you some common configurations just to give you an assist on the typical placements of guardrail and how you might want to label those things. And so we kind of go in order from simplicity to becoming a little bit more complex as we go. Um, but we'll start off with the most basic case. So in this case, you would be just using your length of need calculation. In this case, that would come from our Excel file that could help you with that. So you're providing a length of need from the face of that barrier to shield this hazard for the traffic coming from right to left. And we're going to say that the median here is wide enough so that the back of this guardrail is outside of the clear zone of these guys coming from left to right. So you have a nice wide median. So all you're really concerned about is shielding these hazards from both direction and all the design for the four different pieces of guardrail you see here would pretty much all be the same. So in this case we'll focus on the traffic uh, coming from right to left. So you got cars coming along. As we know there'd be some departure angle here. Typically you'd have a gating portion, uh, a breakaway portion. So the departure line would go through post three and then it would go to the hazard that you're trying to protect against. And so you extend your guardrail out, the length of need in front of that in order to protect that hazard and you're continuing along from right to left and then the Excel sheet also helps you with this as well to know that the guardrail has to extend by at least six foot three inches past the hazard if you're just going to put a type 2 trailing anchorage on there and you're able to use a trailing anchorage because you're not worried about any other opposing lane of traffic uh, hitting this with a head-on collision you're only worried about these guys coming along here from right to left so that's a nice uh, simple piece of guardrail you got an approach terminal here a t type 2 trailing anchor over here. Okay, looking at another example, the plot thickens just a little bit. Um, so again, we'll focus on the traffic coming from right to left. Here we have our two-way, two-lane road setup. It's fairly common, but just looking at the traffic coming from right to left for now, you would, again, you extend this guardrail far enough to provide your length of need to shield this hazard. And you have an approach terminal here because you might be expecting a head-on collision. And so the, for the cars coming from right to left, uh, you do have that covered. Now when you get to the other end behind the hazard, well in another case where there's no other approach lanes in the area, you can just put a type 2 anchor right over here. Um, well the issue here is we have a two-way, two-lane road. And so now we have traffic coming from left to right we have to consider. And essentially what is their clear zone? And if this hazard happens to be within the clear zone of the guys coming along from left to right, then you're going to want to consider protecting that hazard with some length of need. And then the other thing you have to consider, even if that hazard's not within the clear zone of the traffic coming left to right, the end of this guardrail might be in the clear zone of these guys. So in that case, a type 2 trailing anchorage would not be sufficient. And so in that case, you want to put an approach terminal on. So if really the guardrail or the hazard happens to be within the clear zone of the traffic coming left to right, you'd need to use an approach terminal because you might expect a head-on collision. Looking at another example, uh, now we have dual bridges. We have a nice wide median here. And the idea is that for the vehicles coming from right to left, this rigid barrier here is outside of the clear zone for that traffic coming from right to left. And so you really don't have to worry about providing guardrail that's going to shield that. Essentially, we're now placing guardrail uh, just to protect uh, the concrete parapets or the rigid barrier we have here. You'll notice that rather than just having the bare minimum uh, length of guardrail, uh, we have a little bit extra length of guardrail. That's because whatever the bridge happens to be spanning over could be considered a drop-off hazard or maybe it's a, maybe it's a canal or, or you know a water hazard or something like that. And so you extend the guardrail out so that you can then shield that hazard up to the limits of the clear zone. 
and you can provide the length of need, the shield that hazard. So this might be extended a little bit further beyond just the minimum length of guardrail. And so that's really the only consideration you have for that. Uh, you notice we're showing our guardrail slope guards, just showing the way that they'd be called out to delineate the placement of that guardrail. And the guardrail, as you recall, the purpose of that is just to you know, make apparent the, uh, the drop off of that slope abutment for anybody out here doing maintenance or anyone who happens to be in the median. Uh, but we're not going to require that or, or a similar type of wall. It would be just basically a visual obstruction. Okay, now we're moving to another example where it's still a dual bridge configuration, but now the median has gotten more narrow. So now we have that issue where we'd probably be wanting to use our guardrail uh, crossover, or the crossover guardrail is the official name we've given it. So focusing on the vehicles coming right to left here, this rigid barrier we're going to go ahead and say that that is in the clear zone for the traffic coming from right to left. And so you're going to want to extend your guardrail uh, in order to provide the proper length of need to shield that rigid barrier using this guardrail. And now the issue we also have is that if you were to use single face guardrail, the back of the posts, if they were exposed, would be considered a hazard for this traffic coming left to right. And so because the back of post would be a hazard, you need to place some panels on there to make it double face guardrail to make it crash worthy for the cars coming from left to right. And since you have that whole configuration, now the distance from this traffic coming left to right uh, isn't quite as vital because it's been shielded. And the best thing to do to reduce the overall length of the guardrail system is to start tapering across the median uh, with the crossover guardrail configuration. And so when you start tapering across the median, the overall guardrail length can end up being a lot shorter. You can reduce your length of need by a considerable amount. Even if this taper only carries the guardrail maybe six or seven feet in, you know, into the direction of the center line or further away from this, this road here, that can reduce the, the length of need by 60, 70 feet. So it does save a considerable amount of guardrail just by tapering across. An added benefit of that is you get the advantage of moving that approach terminal or crash cushion as far away from the traffic lane as possible. And the closer you can put it uh, to the center of the median, the better to avoid potential impacts. Okay, looking at a, another example, we have our, now we have a two-lane, two-way road going across a bridge. And so we have our traffic coming along from right to left. We can focus on that one first. And the idea would be, okay, well, the first thing you want to think about shielding is the concrete parapet or the rigid barrier. And so they're coming along, so you do want to put some guardrail there to make that end crash worthy. Now, this particular length of guardrail happens to be a little bit longer than the minimum length. Down here, we actually have the minimum length of guardrail. This particular length right here happens to be a little longer because, again, we're thinking, well, whatever this bridge is spanning over, it's likely to be a hazard. And so as an example, we show this extended a little further than the minimum length uh, in order to provide the length of need to shield this drop-off hazard or whatever happens to be right here. Now, coming, still coming from right to left, um, the other thing you might want to be concerned about is the clear zone measured from the edge of this lane. Uh, does it encompass the edge of that rigid barrier? In this case, we're going to assume it does. And so you need to place some guardrail to shield the end of that rigid barrier as well and make that a crash-worthy end solution. And so now you've got some barrier here. In this case, you do have the absolute minimum length of guardrail required. You have the approach transition length plus the approach terminal length, which is 84.3. Um, the reason for that is, well, whatever drop-off hazard we were thinking about for the guardrail on, on the top, um, it's a little further away from this traffic lane, and that would end up reducing that length of need by a considerable amount. And so you, you might not have to add any additional length of need to shield this drop off from the traffic coming from right to left. And so that's why this guardrail is a little shorter here uh, on the bottom. And coming from the opposite direction, it's just all similar by opposite hand, so it's the same concept supply. This concludes the IDS portion of our guardrail training. We invite you to open up module four where we will review our new length of need design tool to assist with designing some of these layouts that we've just gone over. Thank you.